You see, Christianity is never going to be cool. It's never going to be popular. It's never going to be mainstream. It's never going to be accepted by all of society because it goes against human reason. We have to, it, it means that we need to be saved and we need to be rescued and I'm broken and I need help. And that just goes against our human nature. So it's never going to be cool, but it doesn't have to be. Just like fathers don't have to be seen as cool by their kids, by their teenagers. In fact, they don't want that, right? They don't want us to try to be hip. They don't want us to try to be cool. Uh, All they need from us is to be present and to be loving and forgiving and mature and wise. And that's really what the culture needs from all of us as Christians. They don't need us to try to be hip and cool. They need us to be present and forgiving and wise and mature and loving. And so embrace the foolishness of the cross so that you can be truly wise and that you would have some wisdom to offer to our world. The cross of Jesus is an uncrossable line. When Jesus outstretched his arms on the cross, in effect, he grabbed up all the sins, all of yours, all of mine, and kept them from going to God the Father. And so as God the Father looks at us, we don't have any sins because Jesus has got them. And because Jesus then is sinful, because he has our sins, he died and paid the price in full for all of our sins. 1 Timothy 2 says this, For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. The uncrossable line of Jesus' cross is a new idea for the Corinthian culture and our culture as well. You see, your performance can never make you right with God. Only Jesus' performance can make you right with God. You're not going to hear that in culture. That's not going to be a box office movie hit. That's that's not going to be on the most popular radio stations. You're not going to find a a, a primetime sitcom with this as its storyline and theme. But you're going to hear it here. Because the uncrossable line of Jesus' cross is foolproof. It's God's wisdom for our salvation. So you are forgiven children of God, and and now God is calling you to live a new life. To to not just follow the ways of the world. I I know the the, the culture of our world is going to give you a whole different kind of message on how to look at these things, but God has called you to live counterculture, like you live from a different culture. And sometimes when you try to follow this, you're going to look and feel foreign or weird or strange or foolish or just plain wrong. But the reality is, is that be, that's because we do belong to a different place. This is not our home. We, we do live according to a different standard of, of values. The Apostle Paul, when he was writing to the Philippians, he said it this way. For as I have often told you before... And now I'll tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. And so don't be surprised when, you, when, when, when people are enemies to this message. Don't be surprised when people's minds are set on earthly things. Don't be surprised by that. Don't get angry about it. Don't don't get belligerent about it. Don't try to fight it. Just don't be surprised when this is not accepted in the wider culture. Don't be surprised because we're from another place. It says, but our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, 
who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Our citizenship is in heaven. We live according to the values of King Jesus, only empowered by the Holy Spirit. And so God is calling us to live a whole different life. And we're waiting for the day when Jesus will return. He's going to come down. The kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven is going to come down to this earth and Jesus is going to make all things new, including us. He's going to transform our lowly bodies to be like his glorious body. If there's ever anyone in the history of the world who had rights, it was Jesus Christ. He created the whole world. He created you and me. He formed us in our mom's womb, breathed into us the breath of life. Everything we have, everything we have, every good thing we have is from Jesus. And what did Jesus do with all of his rights? Paul says this in in Philippians chapter 2. It says to us, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and of one mind. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Foolproof. It's not the sinful nature way. It's not the freedom way. It's not the, the way of my rights. It's the Christ-like way. The loving way. Where we consider others better than ourselves. So think about all your relationships, and all your attitudes, and all your political leanings, and all your religious leanings, and all your rights. Who do you need to give up your rights to like Jesus gave up his rights to you? Who do you need to love like Jesus loves you? How can we create true Christian community in an individualistic society? Here it is, super spiritual advice. Eat together. Eat together. And that begins, that begins with the Lord's Supper, Holy Communion that we would 
receive this meal together. And, and yes, receive it for what it is. It's personal forgiveness, but it's so much more than that. Recognize that you're receiving it as a community. We're taking communion as a community that we all walk up here sinners and we all hear the words declared to us. We're all forgiven ch children of God. We're doing this together. You are not alone. So eat together. Now, why is this so vital? Why is this so important? Why does God care about this so much? Why, why was he care, cared about this so much uh, in Corinth? Well, because we believe in the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I've heard theologians say that it's an eternal community of love, that the Father loves the Son, the Son loves the Spirit, the Spirit loves the Father. It's an eternal community of love. And what Christianity is, is God's invitation into that community. And that we are to reflect that community here on earth. And so, in a lonely, individualistic society where we might be tempted to live all by ourselves and live just this personal, private faith life, God is calling us to something bigger, something greater, to community. And what is the super spiritual thing that we can do to create that kind of community. Let's eat together. About a little more than 15 years ago or so, I went through a, a horrible time of deep, dark depression. People told me there was hope. I couldn't find it. And since that time, right, as God brought me through that, if I never help or encourage any other person who's struggling with depression, God has already used that time to help many, many people. Because I know I can ensure them, I can encourage them. When you can't see hope, there's still hope. God uses weaknesses to serve and help other people. So what can help us put our hope in the character and work of God? And in other words, when, when we're through with our time of worship and we go out into the, to the real world, how can we take the message of hope with us into real life? First thing, stop the spin. Okay. That there is no hope is fake news. That's a conspiracy theory. That's the devil lying to you. Stop the spin, replace the spin with the good news of Jesus. Crack open your Bible app on your phone or your computer or the book. Holy Spirit used about 40 different men over the course of 1,500 years to write it. There are timeless truths in there. Replace the spin with the good news of Jesus. Share your heart with God in prayer. When you're going through tough times, this isn't where you gotta fake it. God knows it's tough. So often we try to make it on our own. And again, God says, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Jesus isn't saying, suck it up, buttercup. He's saying, I've got you. Rely on my strength. Share your heart with a friend who also loves and trusts Jesus. Stop the spin, replace the spin, share your heart with God, share your heart with a friend. You know what? The world will think you're crazy. But here's the deal. You'll be founding your life on the person and work and character of Jesus Christ. And that's foolproof. And that will give you certain hope forever. Let's pray.